Hello, welcome to the uh, Book of Mormon. Uh, we're going to review the historical context and content from our Come Follow, we Follow Me this week, which is Jacob's 5 through 7, Jacob chapters 5 through 7. So let me start with just a few little helps and some tips as you do your individual and family studies. Here is a great little chart that you can uh, use. Uh, I put the web address down there on the bottom right here. If you can see that on there. But you can just do a search. Type in the Olive Tree Allegory Chart PDF and it really popped right up for me. This is a wonderful little chart that can help guide you through your studies. You have the original visit of the master and his servant in the vineyard. And it talks about the olive tree and what he does with it. And then he talks about how he grafts uh, branches into four different locations throughout the world. And then he talks about the subsequent visits and to see what happens and so forth. And it gives the verses up here. This is a really helpful chart. Again, I can give you some, some tips and some thoughts and some helps, but this chart, I really think, print it out or pull it up on your computer and read chapter 5 together. And th these verses that are in here will be very, very helpful to help you gather a, a deeper understanding of the allegory. There's also uh, every year when they print uh, the enzyme for the year that they're discussing, uh, the Book of Mormon, so every four years or so, there's usually some charts. In March of 2020, on page 45, there is a page about what can we learn from the allegory of the olive tree. Also another piece of helpful information for you. I also think that there's the 1993 seminary videos. They're really cheesy, but they're really helpful to understand the allegory. There on, there's one big uh, YouTube video. Just type in the Olive Gall, excuse me, the Olive Tree Allegory, 1993, and you should see it. It's about a 13, 14, 15 minute video. Or if you want to go into your Gospel Library app, you can find it in there. Uh, you can go to the Seminary Book of Mormon manual or uh, look under videos and do a search. Uh, again, it's there's four or five uh, clips that they go and visit the olive, uh, the tree multiple times throughout the history of the world, just like the allegory mentions. So there's some, hint, some, some hints and some helps for you. I hope that can help you study that. Let me just share a, a few things with, with you as we go through this. Uh, just notice verse 1. Again, this is Jacob chapter 5. Uh, Zenos is a prophet. Uh, he's not mentioned uh, a record of his in the Bible, but he was in the plates of brass. So this is just another evidence of lost scripture, and the Bible doesn't include everything that was mentioned in the Old Testament, because he was around prior to Lehi leaving Jerusalem, and he was found in the brass plates. If verse 3, I think it's also helpful, especially if you're with kids, uh, to make a little chart of all of the objects in the allegory. And what they represent, verse 3 tells us the main one is the tame olive tree is a representation of the house of Israel. Well, knowing that, we can draw some conclusions. What's the fruit? Who's the man in the vineyard? Uh, what is the vineyard? Why is it decaying and growing, waxing old, as it says? And also, verse 4, the man in the vineyard, it calls him the master of the vineyard talks about pruning and digging and nourishing it. This, what a great little object lesson in the springtime to go out in your yard and find a tree and say, okay, let's take a look at this tree. What are some problems? Are there branches shooting everywhere? Are there old ones that we need to cut off? Are there new ones that need to be clipped around the base or whatever? Uh, there's some nice things that you can actually go do out in your garden to see this. Uh, I want to make sure it's noted in verse 6. At multiple times in here, it will say, after many days. In other words, sometimes the story seems like it's all at the same time, but it's not. After many days means there's a substantial amount of time that has taken place. So if we go in here, and you'll notice that the, the master and his servant work together diligently to help this tree uh, of grafting and pruning, and there's all kinds of videos and pictures that you can find out what grafting is and what pruning is, and those videos that I told you, that 1993 seminary videos, they show all of that. And it's in a fun, 
uh, fashion in there too. I'd like you to notice in verse 15 though. Verse 15, there's that phrase that says, a long time past. So look in on our chart, you'll see up at the top where it says first visits, verses 3 through 14. And the second visit is verses 15 through 28. So we have four places around the world. Remember, the vineyard is almost always symbolic as the world, uh, earth, in the scriptures. So when it says it found a, a poor spot of ground, but after the second visit, good fruit came forth. But then there was a poorer than the first spot of ground. Uh, but yet good fruit was found. Now in there, it talks about good ground. Well, we know that the good ground is the promised land. And you'll notice that it mentions in this allegory that in the good spot of ground, there was both good and bad fruit. Well, we know that's Nephites and Lamanites here in the promised land. So it's kind of fun to go through this and read and outline. If you're using paper scriptures, you can take a marker or a, a colored pencil and draw a line separating time periods. That's all, all, all also helpful to do. In electronic scriptures, I color coordinated a few things uh, like different objects and so forth. However, way, whichever way you study, it doesn't matter. You can have a good experience studying it. Uh, with that. Just a couple other items to mention that this chart shows and the videos, the 1993 videos show that the second visits about the time of the Savior, prophets and apostles in Jerusalem went out and brought in members of the church that were outside of the house of Israel. The, the, uh, the missionary work was very effective. And in the third visit, everywhere they visited, the fruit was bad. We know that that's the great apostasy. But the remarkable part is the fourth visit. We know that that is the time before the second coming. That's our time today. And regardless of where these missionaries go, they bring in good fruit. And we're baptizing people and building up the house of Israel in you know, the four corners of the world, including places that we never dreamt that missionaries would be able to go. But they're there and, and doing great missionary work. So here's some, after studying this, here's some questions that would be helpful. Once you get the context and content, you'll understand the allegory and the pictures. It's nice to step back a little bit and ask some questions. Like, what do we learn about the Lord from this allegory? What do we learn about the Lord's servants? The dialogue between the two in this allegory is very interesting. What is happening in our time? What role can I play in gathering in the latter days? If you'll recall, uh, June 3rd of 2019, President Nelson enlisted all of the youth around the world in what he called the Youth Battalion. And he enlisted them to help gather Israel on both sides of the veil. A powerful link to Jacob chapter 5. President Nelson is fulfilling what's going on during these verses there in the 50s and 60s and the early 70s, those verses in, in chapter 5. President Nelson is doing this as strongly as any prophet ever has. President uh, Hinckley started the process uh, of building smaller temples. Even you can go back to President Kimball, started that around the world. But the work's continuing. President uh, Monson uh, lowered the age and increased the number of missionary work, of uh, missionaries around the world, uh, opened numerous missions. Uh, and now President Nelson is challenging us to go out and do this. It's great, great work. So let's go to Jacob chapter 6 now and glean a little bit from this because uh, it kind of concludes the allegory here. Verse 2 reads, And the day that he shall set his hand again the second time to recover his people is, this, is the day, yea, even the last time, that the servants of the Lord shall go forth in his power to nourish and prune his vineyard. And after that, the end soon cometh. And we're right there. Uh, what will the Lord do? How is he going to do it? And what's going to happen next? Well, it's the second coming. Verse 3 
And how blessed are they who have labored diligently in his vineyard. I like that phrase. And I think here we could have a, dis a discussion about how have you been blessed because you've been working in the vineyard? How have you been blessed because you've been a minister to uh, someone in the ward? Or helped share the gospel with somebody? Or done family history work and temple blessings for our ancestors? All three of those are helping to do the work in these the latter days. We should be doing as much as we can in all three areas. But some of us are really talented in one of, or more of those three areas. Let's go to verse 6. It says, Yea, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, for why will ye die? I, I, those, that opening phrase, if ye will hear his voice. Recently, President Nelson has asked us to hear him talks about in the scriptures that every time God the Father speaks, he always invites us to hear his son, Jesus Christ, including 200 years ago in the sacred grove, God the Father introduced Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith and invited Joseph to hear him. Just recently, the church has a new website, and I put the link there. It's just churchofjesuschrist.org slash hear him with an initiative of hashtag hear him that we're invited to share that message with others and then to share how we choose to hear the voice of the Savior today. What a great thing to do this week is to invite others to also hear the voice of the Savior. It's fabulous and relevant. Again, Jacob might be the most relevant book to our day today. And I want to go to verse 7. It says, For behold, after ye have been nourished by the word of God all the day long, will ye bring forth evil fruit? And that's really a question. We've been partaking of the good fruit, and we're asked and invited to go out and, and help gather in the good fruit, not turn our hearing of the good fruit, being nurtured into evil fruit. So... Go out and hear the voice of God. If you get on uh, the church's website, as of today anyway, it changes often, but do a thing. Uh, you can go to one of those tabs on, and there's a whole section about hear the voice of God. Love it. So let's go to chapter 7 now. Jacob chapter 7. Uh, we need to learn a little bit about this uh, Antichrist, uh, Sherem. In verse 1, it says, he came among the people of Nephi. Now, I know I'm doing a little bit of interpretation. And if it's not right, forgive me. Or if you don't believe it or you have another thought, please keep it. I just want to share some thoughts. To me, it sounds like Sherem's not a Nephite. He's coming amongst those people. So if he's not a Nephite, who is he? Is he a Lamanite? That's possible. But there are also other people in America at that time. We know of the Mulekites. They have a different language because by the time they meet up later on, that the language of the Mulekites has been corrupted. Plus, there's other people. Where does this uh, Sherem come from? I, I, I'm not really sure. In verse 4, they spe Jacob specifically mentions that he was learned and he had a perfect knowledge of the language of the people. Again, it's possible the Nephite language was not his native language. But yet, he had a perfect knowledge. He mastered it and had an, a learning above it. So I really don't know who this guy is, but I, I, to me, it almost seems like he's coming amongst the people. I don't think by the time we get to Jacob that the Nephite population is so large that they don't know each other. They really, uh, though they're growing and they're children and, and have cousins and second cousins and so forth, I, I still think it's small enough that they know each other. So when Sherem shows up, he's kind of an outsider to this group. But let's take a see if we can learn a little bit more about him. Verse 2, the more important part about him is what he's trying to do. Just glance at verse 2 for a moment. What is his main message? It's there's no Christ. And he wants to overthrow the doctrine of Christ, which is faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, and so forth, which we've discussed in previous 
lessons. It's all of Second Nephi, uh, 32, all about the doctrines of Christ there. Why was he laboring so diligently? In other words, verse 3, it says, And he labored diligently that he might lead away the hearts of the people. Why does he care? I think we can just pose the question, why do anti-Mormons care so much? Why do they put so much energy? Is it because they really believe that our souls are at stake? Do they put just as much energy in Protestants or Episcopalians, uh, the variety of Protestants, Episcopalians, Baptists? Do they put so much energy in Catholicism or Buddhism or all the, of the other religions and faiths and beliefs that are out there? I just find it interesting. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Except I do know that the adversary is very, very strong in fighting truth. He will fight against all truth, meaning he'll attack the belief of Christ everywhere. But boy, when he can stop priesthood keys and priesthood power and ordinances and temple work, boy, I think he'll spend extra energy there. If you go to verse 6, And it came to pass that he came unto me, and on the wise he did speak unto me, saying, Brother Jacob, I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you. For I have heard, and also know, that thou goest about much. So in other words, he's heard that Jacob's the leader. Again, an insider of these of the Nephites would know that. He's, to me, he's an outsider. Hey, I'm hearing that you're the man in charge. You're the one who's preaching all of this. So he goes specifically to Jacob. And he wants to attack and fight. And they go back and forth for a little bit. Basically what it comes down to is Sharon wants to have, give me a sign. Which is interesting that the Lord gives signs. In this case, it's not a sign that he really, really wants. Verse 6 gives an insight that is interesting though. Sherem says that he believes in the law of Moses. Let's find that here. Uh, verse 7, And ye have led away much of this people, that they might pervert the right way of God, and keep not the law of Mo Moses, which is the right way, and convert the law of Moses, into the worship of a being which ye shall say shall come hundred years pence. And now, behold, I, Sherem, declare unto you that this is blasphemy. No man knoweth of such things, for he cannot tell of things to come. Okay, so Sherem's saying that he believes in the law of Moses, but not in Christ. So how did he learn about the law of Moses if he's not a Nephite? I don't know. Maybe he is a Lamanite, or maybe he is of the Amulekites. But nonetheless, he has this belief that the law of Moses will save you, but the law of Moses says nothing about Christ, which means his knowledge of the law of Moses is completely apostate, because we know everything about the law of Moses was to lead and direct people to Christ. I mean, everything about the sacrifice of the firstborn male, the blood, all of that was all about the atonement of Jesus Christ. So we see that he really is far off. Verse 11, I said unto him, then ye do not understand them, for they truly testify of Christ. And Jacob's doing exactly what prophets do, prophesy of truth and correct false doctrine. So in verse 13, he gets a sign. And what happens to his sign? Well, Verse 20, he dies. And that's the end of the Antichrist of Sherem. And then Jacob uses this as an opportunity to teach his people and us that there are people out there who will teach something that goes contrary to the doctrines of Jesus Christ. And we need to be careful because they're real today. There are people who will teach things that are contrary to faith, uh, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, and the whole atonement of Jesus Christ. So be aware of, of them. Well, to conclude with, I'm going to share one more little thought here, uh, just with Jacob chapter 7. If you go to the end, verse 25, And the people of Nephi did fortify against them with their arms. Uh I guess we need to mention verse 24 first. The Lamanites 
uh, we did verse 25, oh, 24, I'll read it. And it came to pass that many means were de devised to reclaim and restore the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth. But it was vain, for they delighted in wars and bloodsheds, for they had an eternal hatred against us. And they sought by the power of their arms to destroy us. Verse 25, wherefore the people of Nephi did fortify against them with their arms and with their might, trusting in the God and rock of their salvation. Love that. I think that's a great, great way to close. Um, it's interesting that at the very end, well, verse 26 is a long verse. In the middle of verse 26, our lives passed away like as it were unto us as a dream. But if we go to the bottom, it says, we did mourn out our days. I, it, it seems that Jacob doesn't feel his days are a happy a joyful time in the Nephite record. Uh, they're constantly preparing and working to stop and preach. Uh, we don't have those same thoughts and feelings today. President Nelson clearly has a message of hope. There's struggles, there's trials, but going back to the allegory, we're in the part of the allegory that's rejoicing because we're grafting, we're, re, we're not just grafting, we're reaping the fruit from the four corners of the world. So if you'll just ponder for a moment, what can you do to fulfill this part of the allegory? How can you gather people on both sides of the veil plus minister to those in need? Minister and help bring souls closer to the Savior. It is my prayer and testimony that we can all do this. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Next week, we will discuss Enos through the words of Mormon. Have a great week and stay safe and have a, a fabulous week.